नमस्ते फॉलोइंग अप ऑन माय लास्ट कॉन्वर्सेशन विद आनंद प्रसाद लास्ट टाइम वी लेफ्ट ऑफ विद अ हुक ऑन स्पीकिंग अबाउट मूर्ति पूजा एंड यंत्र एंड मंत्र सो दैट इज वेर वी डेल्फ अ बिट इन दिस कॉन्वर्सेशन so where where we left off last time in our debate was the devta idea and yes. things like that what we can do for people like us who are not scripturally learned who are on the more sort of modern path seeking to understand things better seeking to essentially enjoy the benefits of having born in this land is to look for that core essence and in the pursuit of that core essence you will see it will come in mixed form so you have to separate the shaft from the grain you don't have to be critical you don't have to accept the shaft you don't have to criticize it and we tend to when we criticize we tend to throw the baby out of the bath water but this can grab the essence so there will be times where some preachers or some speakers will as i say hit the ball out of the stadium or go over the top and ignore the growing over, over the top just grab what is essential what is what is more important and in your own head start putting together a picture that connects logically in that sense and then seek to experience now in that state and i give a bit of my own experiences that given that we live in a rational world and me coming from a rational sort of uh, background essentially was massively interested in the advaitin philosophy so got into did a lot of reading on advaita did a lot of uh, conversations with people i didn't go to so much lectures because i always found that this more shaft than grain so it would end up being boring so but i did my own reading and give putting pieces together very stimulating for an intellectual mind extremely yes. and uh, extremely pleasurable when you do it in my experience you go there you go there you go there and then you get stuck i don't know if that is the experience for other people but you get stuck in the sense that you have get, you start realizing that every time you read understand hear new things it is the same core that is narrated in a different fashion so 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 people are just explaining it differently but it is the same core so you then it is my experience i found that i came to a certain position then i was stuck so i asked this question of some people that i know that stuck it then i was told that you'll you'll stay like that for a while and then it will change so then came a time where i gave up the idea of ever coming unstuck so i could speak most things that i am speaking just now even at that time yes, but they did not come from it was like the two blind men who had one with slight one i had opened up so uh, you got some of the stuff but you didn't experience fully yes so basically you're saying you've intellectually understood some concepts but what you're possibly missing is an experience of what that so what what it tastes is. like so what happens is you start feeling an emptiness yes i agree i mean i get i, I get your point even in, in intellectualizing it beyond the point there is some you start feeling hollow because it does not somehow it does not work it makes sense you can logically explain it but there is a hollowness and at least my own experiences as you go further with that i guess if you're lucky and that's where i see the huge blessing in being born in this land is that if you were living in america i don't think it'll happen i mean i don't think it can happen so this is where you'll run into people who can either intentionally or unintentionally open some windows i am not even saying open a door or open a slight slit somewhere and then you sort of can dive through that as you dive through that the feeling of emptiness will no longer be there all the intellectual ideas will still be there sometimes those intellectual ideas will, you will understand it differently and in my space i i would say today if, when i when people discuss advaitin philosophy there is all the bogus philosophies <laughs> the reason <laughs> that say that is i don't think you can get to one level unless you go through that but and and what we find 
in the popular sort of hindu intellect is that um, is that shallow conversation around what advaita is uh, it, it is bereft of any flavor to it it is interesting i mean when you when you don't know it's very interesting but it it, it, it is it is shallow i don't know i sometimes it can okay maybe so i'll give it to you that it could be shallow but that may be a judgment from a position of having had some experience yes, of it yes yes that's all i'm saying. i i don't doubt this agree yes. our indian state is somewhere stuck in that no indian state is nowhere even talking of advaita it says this is humbug but it's somewhere i would say that it's somewhere in this transition but it's at that level what it is doing therefore it is denying the existence of anything else the question that we were looking to discuss was the idea of a devta or an idea of a deity or an idea of god the idea of a deity or an idea of a god exists in that other space which is not in this space now let's one of the well, the reason why advaita is as strong an idea today or as accepted philosophy today is attributed to the adi shankara there are two things of the adi shankara's life that you'll hear people say them but you will see we ignore it because those are in contrast with the whole advaita idea those two are one he is having a bath in the ganga and coming out and he runs into a chandala and he abuses him and he says that what is this you have spoiled my day i have to go and have bath once again and chandala says that you are having so much advaita 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 and then you are talking like this so you are actually living in a dvaita world you are recognizing duality you talk about single uh, single existence but your core is one that recognizes duality and then the story is that shankara falls at his feet and says you are shiva i mean everybody is shiva by that logic uh, by advaitin basis but essentially it's a chandala that brings that recognition to him there is the other story of uh, somewhere in kashmir um, a tantric does something to adi shankara so he gets stuck somewhere i am not exactly sure how what happens to him but he basically gets stuck and then somebody else tells him that you need to uh you need to f- go to the devi and he then goes down that path and sort of unwinds himself and comes out of the knots that he had been tied up in but essentially that results in shankara formulating the saundarya lahari the saundarya lahari now when you when you talk in terms of sexuality and how we look at our goddesses the saundarya lahari has in various verses a sexual description of the goddess or what you might consider sexual in our current modern in a, in a, context in a, in, a, in a modern context but that is the woman in a full he is looking at the goddess in a full he is describing so their descriptions are how how a lips are how a breasts are how a hips are etc so it is it comes as a bit of a shock so when it was first when i when somebody first mentioned it to me i didn't take it for face value i went and purchased one from the lady of course it was the english version and i read and they were paras of that nature so adi shankara who is now both your experience of the goddess as well as the experience of the chandala are dvaita in nature now when you find people so casually talk about the god is what, what is it vasudev kutumbakam or the god is omnipresent and it, it is right but it is not relevant i suspect to each one of us because even the adi shankara could not stay true to that complete advaitin idea he had to experience the dvaitin he had to experience the goddess he had to experience the chandala those are true elements the fact that a brahman exists is true but it has no applicability that which is why i call it basically not a useful construct unless you are down that path so unless you are in deep meditative state 
and maybe it has some implication over there but in in a practical life so i see a lot of swami is saying this is has practical utility it has no practical no, practical utility the fact that why you telling me your knowledge should be my knowledge and both of us should not exist so the fact that you even telling me is a recognition of the duality and therefore you would look at it that's the first distinction i would would make because essentially we think of us, ourselves in more advait in terms of popular conversation is an advait in terms and we immediately one of the criticisms immediately you you talk about it like this but you go to temples you go to you're looking at deities you're doing puja why are you doing that if this is it the reason is that that is the truth this is also the truth so it's got the explanation for why both are true lies in the nature of saying the dual nature of matter that the table is both here as well as it is wave which is the way i sort of uh, would like to describe it is that our idea of deities is and this is again scriptural so some of it you will experience you probably experience parts of it but most of us won't experience get that full brahman experience is that to answer the question does a deity exist i would say given you look at science and you look at uh, what we were just describing is that advaita to the existence of duality is that the universe does exist practically we experience the universe i am saying that the existence of multiple dimensions of the universe also exists they are to insist that you can insist saying that my physical experience is that i am in a three dimensional world maybe right it's like i would say it's like two blind men having a conversation but they are beings beyond just our three dimensional world who who you can experience in parts in three dimension but they essentially exist in in higher dimensions our construct of the devatas or the gods is of beings in that those levels the only way for us to in a mathematical sense be able to prove it is to we have got to locate the maths either we come up with the maths afresh or we locate it i think cutting edge science in terms of theoretical physics is taking it in that direction it's not looking at deities and gods and the existence of intelligent beings or sentient beings in those other dimensions but a lot of science fiction has issues like that and science typically ends up catching up with science fiction um that's been our experience as well so they will come a time where modern science will be able to interact with these sentient beings so to answer the question as long as you can experience it the sentient being will exist if you can't experience it then it is only in the nature of belief and it's an interesting path i'm not saying this is what you have to do you can be whichever but an interesting interest interesting path is to transition in the in the realm of trying to experience those sentient beings once you experience it doesn't matter what somebody else says your experience will be true like john nash's is that is really your experience everybody else will say that is bogus it is part of imagination who knows whether it is part of my imagination or not but it is actually my experience the next level is that how do you sometimes demonstrate it's not meant for demonstration i am having this experience now what's the you what use is that experience so in in beautiful mind nash doesn't use these experiences for anything in particular there is no structure he just sees these beings he interacts with them but they are not useful in his regular life we've been able to in india or at some point in time the pagans or the and this existed again across the world were able to develop technology that allowed you to work with those beings for your own benefit for the for, benefit for, of for, for, your for, lives for, 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 for and your community and whatever else. now the confusion occurs when we start ascribing all the word all powerful to a sentient being 
because that's the uh, that's the semitic construct all powerful god so we when we use the term god we ascribe all powerful here so basically uh, allah is a deity so i know comedy but but that's the notion that we ascribe in india because we tend to use that a lot of intellectual class is english speaking anybody who doesn't speak english is a intellectual in any ho sakte so we ascribe the notion of an all powerful to every deity that is very akin to saying that there is a highly effective plumber i can call a plumber he can come and fix things he can come and fix plumbing but he cannot fix electrical faults all powerful will mean that this guy must be able to fix everything we ascribe the need to fix everything to a deity no these are specialists this have come partly because of conversations with you and then learning from sino joseph this has been a wonderful realization for me that personally i um and being a little vulnerable here and you know sounding like a fool or whatever um this whole notion of going to sorry i'm trying to articulate and figure out my thought but sadguru said something uh, very interesting during the linga bhairavi consecration uh so firstly see he this whole connection with shiva uh and uh, an abstract ac- aspect of shiva an advaitic aspect that we are all shiva firstly is intellectually very very stimulating it is also a very powerful way of living also i mean it's useful i so i sort of disagree with it that it's not useful it's useful because just in everyday life if i were to write you know or fold my hands to somebody the idea of namaste is the divine in me is bowing to the divine in you is actually a very i don't know an advaitic whether you categorize it as dvaita or whatever i'm recognizing there are two but finally at least intellectualizing that basically there is one there is no other so and just that way of living is very beautiful so i should just clarify this a bit because i realized that what i said may sound in a particular fashion So when I say bogus, Advaita idea is bogus. Let me describe it in. Let me preface it by saying that as you follow an Advaitin principle, and as you, with the Advaitin perspective, go into a meditative state. What is meditation is a different uh, conversation. But if you can expand yourself into that state. it's a very interesting experience so when i say it is useless it is uh, which is why i say that if you carry on in that path then it is useful then it will it, it it is extremely powerful yes maybe it's a maybe it's this whole construct of pravritti marg and nivritti marg so and i have started looking at the whole idea of devi versus this brahman if you like in from that construct and it's a very powerful construct to frame so so when you go down that pure advaitin path it is extremely stimulating almost i mean i don't know anybody that is down that path quite honestly that is not to say that my knowledge is be all and end all sir i there are many people who are down that path there are many highly elevated beings that have no need to express when you come into their vicinity your answers will just start popping up in your head so those are pure advaitin but we don't function at that level we function at a level where i need to drink the coffee and uh, or i need to smell the coffee see i understand but even I'm, i mean i would not discount that but in any ways in my experience i started from there which is how sadguru's whole orientation with the shivalinga and the seven chakras and all of that i i wouldn't disregard some of that just being in meditation and that it brings benefit to you just a simple act of meditation opens yes mean, yes physically physiologically it expands your brain so perhaps your sense of perception or experience expands for example little things like right you sit on a beach i don't think i have a, had a profound experience so for example fridge of capra 
none of the most profound people who actually impacted my life towards spirituality or Advaita, if you like, was Fridge of Capra, the way you look at life. He, in 1970s, as a nuclear physicist, was sitting at the beach in California and he says, I saw, I saw, in quotes, the, the dance of Shiva, the rising of the waves and the falling of it, the creation of subatomic particles and the collapsing of them. I feel he's, what he's trying to describe is an experience not dissimilar to what Sadhguru describes when he was at the uh, this Chamundi Hill in uh, at Chamundi Hill, right near Mysore, if I am not wrong. He, he he says that I lost my sense of body. I basically did not know where my body started and where it ended. The mountain was me. The air was me. Me. Now this is a very beautiful experience, and it has been repeated. The same thing has been repeated by people all the time, over and over in our tradition. So the reason why I say that it is not useful is that you will always fall out of that experience. Yes, but you also fall back in that experience. So fall back in that experience. Yes, and, and this is the layers, by the way, I've heard some construct about people who are able to bring that experience back to them by their sadhana. And some people who are not, it happens to them and then they are desperate for it to happen again. And it sort of evades them if you like, right? But there are some people who are able to bring it back and at will. Yeah, so, I mean, I would call them so, realized souls, so, enlightened, uh, whatever, whatever they are. Right? So realized is basically they are, they are more evolved, I would say. And they have a greater experience. Their, their vision has expanded more than, I mean, they can see more than what most of us can see. So, when you... When you the construct of Samadhi. Right? Them being able to enter into states where they are able to have that experience of annihilation of the individual at will and enter into Samadhi. I'm guessing that that is what Samadhi means. Now, the challenge is a um, part of the challenge. No, but, but I completely get your point that it is that the whole experience is useless for fulfillment of my life. But okay. that is in the construct of if I am walking the pravritti mark, which right. means I am a grahastha, I have to raise children, I have to suffer in life to reduce my suffering. There is jyotisha, there is visiting a temple. And all of this, Sinu Joseph very beautifully, very, very powerfully correlates to your chakras. So, uh, I can't claim expertise on chakras. But no. but let me, let me describe how the... Maybe that's another conversation or how chakras are, but or how chakras formulate and what is in fact a chakra. Um, but it goes back to how creation happens. How creation happens, uh, how it is described. There is no one scripture called Tantra, but how in Tantra it is understood and in how Sankhya it is explained. Um, because it's a very different story of creation than the uh, Hiranagarbha story. But as you sort of, as you, as you look at these beings or these deities and as you experience them, the other element that I was describing is the how do you use it in your, is it capable of, I mean, why should I accept that there is something in another dimension? So, we found methods to actually get them to do things for us. Now, we have got the other notion of saying that God loves me. This is all. So, these beings need not love you. Your plumber doesn't have to love you yeah. to come and do your work. So, we attribute, some, some plumbers might love you. Some may not love you. Some may, despite being very angry and not wanting to do your work, will still come and do your work. All these will, sentient beings will lie in this space. We again color them by saying benevolent. Yes, that, but that, that is not an Indian construct so, and I have started uh, realizing. Correct, this correct. is a very Abrahamic construct correct. of benevolent so, so, God. So, so. so, not benevolent, but these are sort of beings that exist. So, the other way of also as a common man who is not going down this path to experience, which is what our civilization was primarily about, it did not require every individual to experience everything. but 
our civilization was constructed on the basis that some people can get the plumber to come to your home and fix the plumbing. And therefore, I have the ability, I can do it for you. So, our civilization is constructed on the basis that there are many people, there are some things I'll do myself, and there are many people that can get these beings to come and do things for me. Be of service to you, and these are essentially the Brahmins of the temples, the priests basically, or, or, priests or, or whoever. Sadhakas. I mean, the Brahmins were better at it because the Brahmins started off at a very young age. The other sadhakas often did not start at a young age. Most sadhakas will say that a Brahmin who does exactly the same that they are doing are better at it. And my explanation for that better is that because they actually started... Not only started young, but there is of course an element, I would not deny it, is of uh, uh, generational memory, if you like, for the... Planet. Genetic... Genetic disposition. Disposition. Yeah. To, to do and this. One is genetic, which is of your ancestry if you like of course you know so one and and the other aspect perhaps is also of the sukshma sharira this is a new realization that i'm sort of beginning to understand a little bit better that the when we die um, it is not the soul that is transmigrating to a new body very beautifully, I just heard video, I don't remember where, that the Sukshma Sharira is actually acquiring a new physical body. So it is actually all your accumulated memory and your interaction with the world, your the taste, the bad taste, which is nothing but karma, the good and the bad, all of this that you are acquiring, what you have gathered, you are taking to a new body. So and it will continue from there. So perhaps. some will describe it as, I am digressing just now, but it, it talks to the technology. Is that there is no soul and there is no you. What happens is that there is a bunch of karmas yeah. that come together that move yeah. collectively. Yeah. Uh, they will call it, the terms used sometimes a vasna samskara. Vasna does not mean lust. Uh, but it is that inclination. Uh, which karma has brought together. With, there is a longer conversation on how does karma come into existence, how the universe, and that's the the tantric, the sankhya yeah, we'll approach that I was talking about. But, but coming back to, so I start deploying these beings. Now, and these beings, so if three dimensions can exist, four can exist, five can exist, six can exist, seven can exist. So they are basically infinite dimensions in mathematics. Indian scripture, different scriptures will have different dimensions in play or different levels of existence in play. More common one is seven up and seven down. I have no experience, I can't tell you otherwise. I am in that context, I am like the blind man and two blind men having conversations. I have to function either on belief. But there is no experience of the seven dimensions. So they are, the scripture, the technology says that they are different levels. Now part of that technology is over a period of time, scripture will describe it as saying that at some point in time there was no need of idols, no need of temples and as Kali Yuga began the need for idols and temples yeah, came into existence. I've heard this repeatedly, I'm not even sure. But I won't get into the logic of things like that. but. What is clear is uh, the building of idols. Now, I would assume that this building of idols existed all over the planet. But people have described it in a superficial manner. So, it seems as if it is idol worship, etc. But there is actually a process around the world. It was one of energizing. So, consecration is not bringing energy from top and putting it in. It is rewiring just that material so that it gives, it brings about that energy in it. So that change happens at different levels. Now, initially it started in stones and in wood and in unformed matter or material things. I can't speak to the timing of when mantras and yantras came into existence. I am assuming that is much before we started using matter. Uh, and for various logical reasons, I mean, you can get into debate and I can say that all right, this is older. But what does the mantra do? What does the yantra do? What does this process do? It is a means to sort of communicate. 
with these energies or these sentient beings. The question is, I am a being, but I am also energy. Um, so, how does somebody communicate with them? At human level, we communicate in one manner, but if you have to communicate somewhere else, we communicate differently. Then, the later stage became idols. So, you gave form to it. Those got human form or got semi-human form, got, I forget the term, where it is half animal, half man. Sort of all forms came into existence. And so, therefore, at some level, so these didn't, they, they, these are not forms of art. Today, we have a lot of deities that look nice or look interesting. But a deity need not look. Deity can look very fierce, can look terrifying, can look different things. But I don't, we don't have too many terrifying looking deities. Because to, the, I mean, to our human eyes, they need to look nice and benevolent. But we started doing idol creation in that fashion. Now, what did... So, how does somebody create an idol? Is that there is this... It's not an image in clear sense. There's some written instruction that this is how the deity will look, but there is a degree of, there's a leap into another dimension that people who traditionally make idols do. I'm not talking about artists who are doing art, who get into that dimension and they are able to create an uh, idol in that nature. Once matter is crafted like that, it is easier to energize it to meet to reflect part of what that sentient being is in, in that other dimension. The older version of this was the same being. Now, this is in three dimensions. So, I have con constructed a Ganapati that is in three dimension. If this Ganapati were to become two dimensional, let us say if you look at me in two dimensional, how would I look? So, you compress that into two dimensions. That is your Yantra. So, it is the same being, it is the same deity as you expand it into. So, a Sri Yantra expanded becomes a pyramid into three dimensions. The, otherwise, it shrinks into a Sri Yantra. So, the deity in three dimensions is the reflection of the Yantra. So, you will find very often in a lot of the older temples, there will be a Yantra placed below the primary deity, the idol. A primary murti. I mean, you can use whatever term you want to. But basically, the energy comes from there. The energy can come from some very, very different kinds of things that are unappetizing to hear even. Uh, so, it can come from various forms. On top, you might see something benevolent and nice looking, but it might come from a source that culturally to you is unacceptable and revolting. That is its nature. Science has no morality. Science has no ethics. Science is what it is. It does what it does do. You can like it or not like it, but that is uh, consensual sex can create a child. Rape can create a child. So that is the nature of that. When you transpose this into sound level, that is your mantra. So a mantra can get transposed into a yantra, which then brings it from the wave form into two dimensional that can get transposed into three dimensional which is deity so our none of this is a complete reflection of the deity they are a means they are a tool to interact with the deity when you cons when you when you create a temple or when you in kerala you was use the term shetram uh, when you create consecrate a shetra so you don't consecrate the the deity you consecrate an area it allows, in that Shetram, it allows easier interaction. It also has an impact on you. So, when you go to some of these, you'll feel nicer. Or None of these are art. Huh? Or like Sino Joseph says, it actually impacts some one or more of your chakras actually. So, you can call it chakras. But basically, physically what many of us can experience, you go to a space, you'll suddenly, most of us describe it as it is peaceful. I feel nice. Quietening down. I quieten down. It had beautiful culture. This, this, is, this, is, this is how we describe these experiences. Oh, that temple looks so beautiful. It's so magnificent. It's so large. It is, we are struggling to find words to describe our experience. Our experience is way beyond, I would suspect, just peace. You describe it as I'm feeling nice, I'm feeling calm. I'm, but those words are insufficient to describe really what you are experiencing. 
what some people will describe is it is having some impact on your chakras and things like that. So that going back to after this long conversation is an answer to what a deity is, what an idol is, what a yantra is, what a mantra is, how do you connect these how do you use them? and they are sort of all interconnected and how do you use How do you use it for the benefit of a human life while remaining in the world? For the common man, it is how do you use it for men and different deities. Some are, for some people, the experience of the deity is the be all and end all. They don't need to use it for anything else. Uh, It is just the fact that I have experienced is the end. So, I would describe for me that is the way I look at it. It's not for any other form of benefit, just the experience is the be all and end all in itself. And basically, possibly also because you may be at some place in the Maslow's hierarchy of, or, you're right, so you're not in need for, say, material benefit. And so the experience, which is at the top of the Maslow's pyramid, if you're familiar with <laughs> no, I wouldn't describe myself like that. But but that is the different levels at which you can operate. So it's not uh, when we take the superficial manner of criticizing uh, temple jaro, your superstitious, blind faith, etc. That's not, that is you taking a 30,000 view on Indian civilization. 30,000 feet above in the sky. Airplane se tum dekh rahe, that is how Indian civilization looks like. But as you come closer, you start looking at the small curves and the changes and so it it's more than 30,000 view. So our lot of our intellectual deliberation is at that 30,000 feet level. Is that we don't, and that's my... Very judgmental level also, very so ridiculing judge. level. Uh-huh. And basically all driven from either an Abrahamic idea or a very scientific worldview of that this is dogma and other things. No, it's a limited scientific view. It's not expansive it's not scientific. Expansive. An expansive scientific view will... Will actually take you to this place. Will take you to this place.